through the shades of entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. latest venture is an Amazon private label course designed to share his expertise in the strategies and pitfalls of the ever-evolving Amazon marketplace. Please welcome the founder of Oxygen Seller, Ian McIntyre. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Ian. How are we doing, my friend? We were actually talking there uh, momentarily about uh, Oxygen Seller. So, Ian, give us a little background. Who is Ian? Uh, Thanks so much for having me. My name is Ian McIntyre. I'm a serial entrepreneur and coach, uh, both business and life. Uh, And Oxygen Seller is a company where we uh, help people expand their brand or develop brands bring them to the Amazon marketplace as a primary, but not just there to multiple e-commerce platforms um, through the whole creation process of identifying products, bringing them to manufacturing and then to market. Uh, Basically, I was a uh, martial arts instructor and stuntman. I got injured very badly and pretty much spent about 20 years going through health challenges. So I needed to start to develop skills that would allow me to work from home successfully. Along that journey, I started coaching a lot of individuals, friends coming over, then started coaching them on some of their business endeavors, eventually becoming a full-blown coach and consultant, as well as working on a couple of my own companies. And uh, that led me to the path of Amazon, ultimately, to start selling product and really understanding the e-commerce landscape. A little bit of experience back in the day with eBay, but definitely more so with Amazon and how much of a behemoth that's become. And then also looking at so many of the other landscapes like TikTok and what have you, and just bringing that knowledge to other people because I love to share with people and help people find the opportunity to succeed more so than where they may have been already. You know, I got I got to admit, it has been fascinating to see the growth of Amazon in comparison to eBay, uh, just because eBay has been around for so long. And I recall, you know, even in the middle school days, uh, jumping on eBay and selling little things. And now it's, uh, it, it's 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 almost obsolete. They they keep trying to reinvent themselves with various things, like a you know creating a sneaker reselling platform. But I, again, I think it's 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 remarkable how quickly Amazon outpaced it. Now you mentioned you were a serial entrepreneur, so I would love to kind of get into that. But before we get into that, I'm I'm actually really interested to hear. Tell us some more about your stunt devil days. How did you kind of get into that? Uh, what injury and then how that injury occurred to trying to kind of kickstart your entrepreneurial career? Sure. So what I primarily did with stunts was work with Tesla coils, which are basically giant lightning generating machines. So I would get into a metal suit and I would either get hit by 15 foot bolts of lightning or project them off of my body. And so we did this for stage shows, for TV, for film. Yeah, it was quite a wild time. It's taken me around the country. It's taken me to a few different countries. So it was a phenomenal experience. But uh, I was a martial arts instructor as well. And what ultimately put me down was a really bad adductor tear, basically a groin tear. Um, Unfortunately, what happened is it developed a massive piece of scar tissue that would put pressure on all these kinds of nerves, mimicking other injuries. So as I went to doctors over the years, we're basically misdiagnosing and chasing the wrong thing. And so it took about a decade to resolve that injury and then another decade to resolve a whole bunch of other health problems that had developed in the first decade. So I spent a lot of time, not just with poor health, but trying to create solutions and thinking outside of the box and who I could see and what I could do. And with that, also trying different business models. Some didn't work out so well because my health would inevitably catch up to me and other ones like e-commerce definitely allowed me to plow forward. So it, it was quite a journey. 
You know, I got to say as, as a dad, I would be remiss without saying this, but it sounds like your stunt devil days was shocking. <laughs> yes, folks. I know. I know. Horrible, horrible. If, thank, thank you for sticking with me here, Ian. <laughs> I, you know, in a way it, it almost had to be said. So it had to, somebody had to do it at some point. So let's start about that. Now you mentioned you started transitioning to new to the entrepreneurship world. What was your first entrepreneurial endeavor? Um, was selling comic books, actually. It was reselling, buying comics from a shop and then selling them at school to other students. A true a true uh, entrepreneur at heart. Now, did you start doing this during when you were going to school or was this post-industry uh, in- injury? No, no, no. This was middle school when I started oh, I doing it. that. Love so it. I always had that idea and just kept pursuing different opportunities. Um, and then for a while, I did the, the normal, got jobs, got food service jobs, low tier jobs to really help enforce that that wasn't for me. But also I found, you know, I'd go up to the manager and go, you know, if we rearrange these shelves a little, it'll work better. And was getting the, well, corporate pays a lot of money to somebody to arrange it this way. And I realized I didn't have a lot of sway. And I always wanted to have more of an impact. Sometimes that impact didn't lead to good things, but that's business, that's learning. And so, you know, that's okay. But I always was pulled to let me take the reins and see what I can do. And so as you have this entrepreneurial itch at a very young age, right? And then you, this injury occurs after post industry injury, what was your kind of first, uh, you know, real endeavor back into the entrepreneurial, uh, granted, I would say being a stunt devil probably has his own entrepreneurial, you know, uh, tactics as well with it, within that own industry. So for me, I started doing two things. What I did for money was started selling books on eBay. And what I did is a little bit more of a hobby just as developing the skill was starting to do life and business coaching. And so it was a couple years of me working with dozens of people that started to really show that I can do more with that and started consulting businesses, helped a couple businesses recover from the edge of bankruptcy. So because I was used to dealing with so many challenges in my own life, taking the approach of how many challenges some businesses have, I didn't find it to be overwhelming. In fact, it was more like a puzzle to solve. How can I resolve this in the most efficient way possible? And it seems like with this new endeavor, the oxygen seller, you, you kind of, again, identified an issue, created a solution, and now you're essentially giving it to the masses and kind of educating. So tell us a little bit more about oxygen seller. What is it and what are you doing? So uh, fortunately, I partnered with a prolific Amazon seller, somebody who has sold over $350 million worth of products wow. in the last 15 years. And he had a course several years ago. I went through the course, and that was a huge exposure to me working through all of this. And so we were talking, and he, it's, we're bringing back the course. I'm going to be leading the coaching and managing a lot of the day to day. He is absolutely involved and helping with levels of inspiration that are hard to match because he understands the systems in and out. So it's from a concept, how to create that brand, how to how that brand messaging can connect with people, how to think outside of the box with products and, and getting them manufactured, but then also how to practically manage the platform and the day to day actions. And for some people, they're ready to go. And other people, they need a little bit more of that personal encouragement and that understanding and support to make sure that they can find success as well. So, I mean, at my core, I'm a teacher. I love helping people get that knowledge faster because I look at my time being injured. If I can help somebody shorten the gap between where they are today and where they want to be, that's an incredible feeling. Yeah, yeah, folks. And if you have not yet, uh, again, this is a great opportunity to plug the newsletter. Uh, Please subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter because we'll have this information on the newsletter. But the beauty thing about their their website, it's, it's really called, you know, the Amazon Mastery Program. So, you know, I always think of like YouTube as uh, YouTube University, right? It's a great platform to go get educated on a lot of different niche things. Uh, But what this team is really doing, you know, first thing, section one, Amazon Seller University, you know, so really kind of diving into the ins and outs of the logistics that you're going to need to become an Amazon seller. But then not only that, how do you continue to launch products on it and then continue to earn uh, a revenue on that? And so a really interesting system. Now, how, how did you guys, how did you and your partner kind of connect and just determine, Hey, you know what? I think we have a great idea here. Um, So we've just been talking about it for quite a while. 
and I've gone to him many times to get some ideas, refine ideas, see if I'm on the right track with what I'm pursuing. And as we've just been talking and my coaching is getting just more involved in general working with people, it became, well, it's sort of a natural fit. Do we want to put this together? And the answer was a resounding yes. And so it's exciting to be able to see people grow with what they're trying to do and find sometimes their passion is what they lead with. Sometimes making money is what you lead with to find your passion. And either way is fine. The idea is how do you get there? And I love YouTube. YouTube is fantastic and I've learned so many things. But at the same time, you can get a lot of really good general and occasionally good specific. But to get that one-on-one, -on -one, that you know, intimate group, to be able to bounce those ideas back and forth, it really helps to take that extra training. Yeah, I, I can't, I couldn't agree more, you know, having a cohort of individuals to bounce ideas off of and, 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 you know, really kind of go over some issues that you may have that you may not think is relevant to other individuals. Um, but it's interesting because what you see is, you know, through entrepreneurship, it's still a business. And so everybody has marketing issues, everybody has staffing issues, operational issues, uh, and just finding the best practices to kind of help focus uh, focus on those areas of need. Uh, but having a cohort is, is so important, you know, that, that kind of networking capabilities uh, is just really nice to have. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's really, again, the personalized uh, touch is important because again, YouTube, like you mentioned, YouTube's great, but you can't ask questions right? You, it's not like a live session. Uh, sure, you can add a comment, but hopefully they'll get back to you. You never know. But this this educational series that you created really is kind of hands-on approach guiding entrepreneurs to success, correct? It is. It really is. And that's the thing is all the ins and outs, like any business, there's a million little things that nobody's going to tell you because there's just so much to do. But as you're going through it, you get each piece, you advance, you build upon it. Before you know it, you've launched a product. Now you can launch your second, third product following the same ideas. And then again, taking it off platform because as good as Amazon is, do I want to miss out on TikTok? Not at all. What if I can also sell the same product on eBay at the same time just to sell more units? So the idea is the framework that you lay down to be able to achieve this. And Amazon has made the process pretty user friendly as things go. Uh, but this is where we also come in to make it a little more user friendly. But then to take that and expand beyond because business is always changing. It's always evolving. And if you're more on the front forefront of that and able to pivot as things come up, you really extend the life of your business and the amount of money that you can make from it and creating that, you know, this sort of cliche saying of financial freedom, but it's not when you have it. And so being able to have that reliable income, steady stream that you can build even while you work another job is really pretty, it's advantageous. I mean, one thing I'd like to point out is these days, a lot of times to get a product into stores, before you had to know somebody, really have an in, go through a very lengthy process, build up a ton of inventory. Now, if you do a lot of business on Amazon, you might be able to pitch that to a store that goes, well, you sell a ton of these. We want it on our shelves. So it becomes that pipeline to be able to take that product to multiple places. Yeah, that's very, very true. You know, the grassroots effort, folks, is alive and well. Um, using Kickstarter campaigns to to see if proof of concept is there uh, is really important, especially if, if you're going to have to, uh, you know, do a lot of capital investment to build out that product uh, or store that product, ensuring that, you know, you actually have proof of concept before you go in and d dive into the deep end is extremely important. The last thing you want to do is, you know, put in a large order of, a, a, you know, a couple thousand units and, and you realize that you actually don't have a market for for what you created, uh, which happens often. So just buy it and be mindful. Now, Ian, let's, let's take a step back and start thinking about your journey into the, you know, the online space, uh, you know, whether it be eBay or Amazon or whatever it is. What were some aha moments that you're like, wow, I, I thought I never thought I needed to think about this uh, when I'm selling online. What are some things that you've uh, learned throughout your process? One of the major things is the logistics of getting everything shipped out. Now, if you only have a few items that you're sending, it's not that big of a deal. But, you know, you get 30, 40, 100 items going out in a day. There's a lot of logistics there in what you need to manage and getting everything out and how much time it takes. Um, one thing that's very popular now with Amazon is using a prep center. You know, some place that you're going to send all of your goods to, they're going to label them, package it all up, ship it out. 
and how much time that can actually save. So there's just a lot of these little things to consider like that, um, learning keywords and SEO, because one of the things is sometimes you start with a product idea and it works. Other times you're just looking for what people are searching for. So what you get, you're putting right in front of them. So there's all of these different concepts. And it used to be at a point in time where these were entirely different careers to put each one of these pieces together. And now there's so many resources online, one person can do it which really makes it nice but then you can also hire other people it's sometimes in other countries where you get quality work for lesser price so you can grow your business from a single person into something quite sizable without needing to take massive amounts of investment or partners that you really don't want to work with to achieve your goals so i think it's freed up a lot of the ability that we can take which is incredible yeah and you know one thing i'd always encourage entrepreneurs is you know, before you start outsourcing things, do it a couple of times, like get, get yourself uh, knowledgeable within that. You don't have to, you can be the jack of all trades, master of none, but the goal is, is you, if you're going to be the CEO and you're running this organization, it's imperative that you really know the, a lot of the ins and outs. And that includes all the operations, the marketing, the sales funnel, you know, understanding those pieces and then just creating, you know, creating a structure around those operations. So when you do decide to let go of the reins, the next person that comes in can continue to move forward with it. You know, uh, have a location where all your policies are located. Who's the owner of that policy? When was it last updated, right? And then on a quarterly basis, review them. Uh, I think what we're seeing too, from a legal perspective is a lot of things are coming down the pipeline that now make you, they're going to force you to change, you know, your workforce policies, your, your, the, your diversity policies, all these different things. So being mindful of that is really important. And I, I got to tell you, Ian, one of the most surprising things for me in the online space was cost of shipping. That <laughs> it, blew it is my no mind. joke. Yeah. Like, well, tell, tell me how your, your team kind of manages the, cause again, the cost of shipping for a small podcast like myself is, is astronomical. 15% essentially of my costs. And we just got noticed that USPS is raising the rates on certain packages. So these things happen. And when that happens, you have to factor that cost into what you have. Sometimes products become less viable. Other times you have to raise your price some, or you just make a little bit less money, but it's okay. So it's like any business expense, you need to be on top of it and looking at things. I mean, qu quarterly is a big thing, but really looking at it at least monthly, you want to know before a big report comes out so that you can make those adaptions. And ideally, you're not working so tight on your margins that you're able to absorb some of these costs as they come up because it's not necessarily just shipping. It can be so many other things that happen. And to your point with hiring, uh, not only do I agree with what you're saying, but one of the problems is sometimes people think they hire somebody and they're done, it's solved. And the reality is not only do you have to train them, but what if you have to go through three or four people that you try out to find the right one? And that's not a big deal if you walk into it kind of expecting that. But if you think it's one and done every time, that's just emotionally draining as opposed to going, well, it might take me six people to find the right candidate, but that candidate when they're trained will then buy me back X amount of hours a day. So there's just, there's a lot of factors to consider. I, I completely agree. And, and the best way to kind of lower, like um, lower the learning curve for these new employees is creating operational policies that they, hey, here's the thing that you're going to read uh, before the first, you know, the first couple of weeks of your job, you're basically reading op operational policies, understanding where things are at, understanding why we do certain things a certain way, talking about your brand guidelines. So, so if publications come out, things are all structured. Here's the font we use, the size we use, the color, you know, all of these things uh, go into a big picture. When you think of large institutions, even the small ones, it, it's all about consistency. When it comes to any entrepreneur, uh, the biggest challenge is really consistency sometimes. Now, Ian, with you, you mentioned you've done a lot, and you're you're building you're building this program, the, this uh, this new uh, organization. Now, what are, what would you say some of the challenges either you faced, or maybe some challenges that sellers might face? You know, a new seller kind of going into the Amazon space. What are some challenges they can expect to face, and what are some of the challenges that you faced? So that's a great question. The probably the biggest thing is you're going to end up doing, I don't know, 10 to 15 different tasks that you may have never done before. So off the bat, it's just how new everything is. And whenever there's something new you're doing, there's extra challenge and learning curve to it. You have to do it more times than you think. So, for example, reaching out to manufacturers. 
if you've never done it before, I recommend, you know, at least reaching out to five, maybe 10, so that you can get the experience, see who's contacting you back, how they're communicating, what their samples look like. So ultimately, the next time you might need to talk to two or three, but in the beginning, you kind of need to go overboard on things to understand how it works. Uh, another big challenge that I've seen a lot of people have is that analysis paralysis. So in one sense, it's you got to go do a bunch of stuff, but if you spend too much time overthinking it and not taking those actions, you don't actually move the needle forward. So it's having all of those conversations, getting familiar with it and understanding mistakes will be made. So trying to see where those pitfalls are or more commonly are so that you can try and avoid them or at least recover faster and understand mistakes happen. So I'd say from that emotional standpoint, it's just being okay with an iterative process. You're going to be learning. From a taking action standpoint, it's like you said, consistency. If you're consistent, even if you don't have the most time in the world, but you put in that consistent one to two hours a day, now you're able to build off of that. And just like money in the S&P, it compounds. That skill compounds, that knowledge compounds. If you put in a lot of hours into a product that doesn't work, you could say you failed there or more likely you learned all of these steps that you can now apply to the next product before you launch it so these are just the common things because if you have that stick to it attitude and work on being consistent any of the problems that arise are manageable it's just you might need to wait a day or two breathe it out and come back to it and go okay let me get through this part and get on to the next part and and then it starts to work itself out very well said. You know, listeners that listen to this show often know I say this quote, I've never failed a day in my life. I either succeed or I learn. And Ian exactly amplified that or amplified that by stating, you know, hey, you sh you may have been focused on a product for five years, but the amount of things you've learned uh, through that product design phase, through the stage gates, through the creating your business, through taking sales calls is really important. Now, one of the things you also mentioned was, you know, reaching out to, to the vendors, right? What what are some questions an entrepreneur should be asking, especially with somebody that's new, that's pretty green to this space, and they're reaching out to manufacturers? What questions should they be asking? So there's a lot of the basic questions, which are, you know, can they make this product? What's their MOQ, their minimum order quantity? So you have an idea of the baseline of what you would need to spend. Uh, I like to get an idea maybe in the first conversation, maybe the second, but what kind of pricing breaks there are. So again, you have this idea, what their lead time is. So how long is it gonna take them to get you that product? Sometimes if it's a very small product and you're ordering from China, you might have two options. It could be air freight, which is more expensive, but gets you faster, or it's coming via ship. And that could take a couple of months. Um, and then I like to ask some things a little more general, like you know, what do, when your bigger clients make orders what do they do so i know how to best operate within your frame because as much as you want them to make your product if it's easier for them to communicate with you that helps a lot and then one of the things that i like to do especially if you're going through china you're going through alibaba but you can do this with other other countries as well get them on so alibaba has an app where you can do a video chat get on video with them see the factory have them show you around real quick you might not know what everything is but you want to see is it does it look like a disaster does it look like a functional place are things you know is this someplace you could see yourself working with to have that understanding so it's a lot of technical questions just to get the idea and then a little bit of that reassurance of you know make sure you actually have a factory you know, some people are uh, brokers. Now, if you're contacting a broker for a, being a broker, that's okay. But if they're a broker that says they're the manufacturer and then they're going to another warehouse to get the job done, you now have this communication barrier between you and the end result. And so it gets a little harder. And if they aren't good at their job or take their foot off the gas, now you're stuck in a position where you're trying to reach a different factory. So it's all of these little things that show you the process to make sure that you're getting the goods as you're supposed to. You know, that that's a great point. That's a great red flag, I think, for entrepreneurs to think about, um, you know, making sure you're knowing who you're working with. Uh, like you mentioned, it's not the broker, it's actually the manufacturer, uh, you know, ensuring that they have a factory, ensuring they can do your product. What are, have you ever faced any difficulties with a manufacturer that you're like, ah, I'm glad I went through this moment because again, we're, we're, you're learning. And then what, if we went, when you went through that moment, 
how did you how did you pivot from it? I've absolutely had that happen. Um, I went with somebody that I didn't know as well. This was earlier on as I was learning this process and everything seemed good up front. I didn't do a particularly large order, but the product was wrong. And we also hadn't discussed anything about if there's defects in the product, are we getting some free units? Is there a discount? How are we managing it? It ended up getting resolved, but the amount of back and forth that had to happen, the amount of pushing that had to happen really made it, it was a very stressful event. I had a lot of money tied up. Like I said, it, it worked out in the end. We got the correct product, but I would have liked to have not had all of that stress. And there were moments where it seemed like it could have gone very bad. You know, I was frustrated, so I would be heated at times and I had to humble myself and calm down a lot and say, okay, look, I just want a resolution. It's not about right or wrong at this point. It's about getting it fixed and moving forward. And so that really taught me the more you can vet up front, there's no guarantees. But it, some of the vetting up front can avoid these situations. And that really, uh, that peace of mind is, it's worth its weight. Have you ever had a moment of self doubt? I have had somewhere between one and three million moments of self doubt. <laughs> um, I have had a lot of self doubt. I actually, I don't like having it, but I have self doubt all the time. And the reality is I keep checking in with myself and saying, okay, I've overcome these challenges before and these other ones in these similar situations. And that gives me confidence. And for the listeners out there that haven't really done a lot necessarily, so that self-doubt, you don't have as much evidence. It's okay. You build that over time. And so by taking that action, by working it through, if it doesn't, as you said, if it doesn't work out, you've learned something. And if it does work out, You've also hopefully learned something and you gain that success. You build that strength over time. So that's what I, it happens to me a lot. I'll have that moment of self-doubt. Is this going to work? I just paid the money. Am I going to get the product? I just listed the product. Is it going to sell? But the reality is at every stage, it either does what I want it to, or I learn quickly why it didn't. I make that adjustment and then it has the chance to do what I want it to. Yeah, and imposter syndrome is quite the fina, a phenomenal, uh, uh, you know, emotional toll on people. And I, I got to tell you, it's it, it, there's a saying, you know, successful people are never satisfied with success because they're too busy searching for the next successful thing, you know. And, and so essentially, what that means is they're constantly trying to make them improve themselves, make themselves better, right? Learning, uh, and, and so that's that's one key thing to think about, folks. Is is don't don't feel like you've failed because one product or one person said anything negative. If if I, if I believed in that, then I would have stopped after my first negative YouTube comment because believe me, they do come. Uh, but you know, just continuing to push forward, doing consistency, making sure you're you're building relationships outside of your inner circle, really kind of working like like Ian mentioned, working with vendors and manufacturers, and you know, talking with other like-minded individuals within your industry. Uh, there's a lot of people that are willing to network and share their information like Ian is doing right now uh, with their with their website. And so, you know, again, go check out their oxygen seller. Check it out. Uh, again, it's, it provides a lot of great insight in how to build a brand on Amazon. Now, Ian, with, with that said, there's a lot of there's a lot of sellers on Amazon, right? There's millions of people probably. How there does are. an entrepreneur differentiate themselves? How do they build a brand on Amazon? So one of the best ways is to build a brand. And, and what I mean by that is you start to brand what you're doing. So it's, a brand isn't just a logo. It's not just a name. It's a story. And so by creating a story, by creating one of the things we do, so you have product pictures and then you have what are called lifestyle photos. And those are, you know, somebody using the product, somebody of authority using the product and starting to show that this product is something that isn't just something what people want, but it fits in their lifestyle. This is what I need. This is incredible. This is the thing that I lean towards. And so by creating the story behind it, that might be a, a real person, it might be a fictional person, but something that ties it together, that tells the story visually with pictures, with the written word, with videos, with the motif. It could be the colors and the additional items that are in with your package. All of these things together tell something more rich and fulfilling than just we have a product. And for example, look at Nike. Nike is ubiquitous with sports. 
not any one sport. Yeah, Jordans have basketball shoes on lockdown, but like, but they have tennis, they have runners, they have golf, they have all of these different things. You don't necessarily attribute it to a sport, you attribute it to sports. And people that don't play sports still wear the products. But you have this thing that does support an active lifestyle that supports a this messaging, this branding behind it. So now you're a little bit more bought in. And some people still just go buy average no name shoe and that's okay. But Nike is one of the big dogs for a reason because this brand is there. And so that doesn't happen overnight. But at the same time, that story that you're weaving into your product, it allows people to connect with it in a way that beats out a lot of sellers. And there are products that do great without it, but there's also products that become so hard to overcome that competition. And some of these products also end up being able to sell the entire brand for an exit strategy, which can pay incredibly well. So that's kind of the idea. And that's one of the things we work on is helping people to understand how to bring that brand to life, how to think about it. And you can also leverage AI these days, GPT or whatever else to start to give you ideas and flesh out a potential story. And you're still gonna wanna go in there and give it your own personal touch, but it helps you if somebody's not very creative, give me 10 brand ideas based on these parameters. Give me another 10 and it just spits them out and you go, wait, I kinda like this, this connects with this. Let me take these two or three over here, put them together and refine it. And so now all of these things together, I think really give you a leg up compared to a lot of the competition. Yes, very, very true. And, you know, folks, if, if don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there uh, when you're building a brand. I, I know it's sometimes weird uh, to hear yourself on a podcast or hear yourself on a recording, but the best way to build a brand is build a community. And how you build a community is, is not outside of selling items, but become a subject matter expert within that field. Uh, you can do this you leveraging TikTok. Ian, you mentioned, you know, getting on TikTok, leveraging LinkedIn, leveraging Instagram, um, doing little reels, even if it's a 30 second clip talking. I, I've seen so many br new golf brands have been coming to fruition from the actual social media sphere. Uh, and it's, again, it's usually individuals just talking just generically about what they know about golf, what they like about it. And they create a small community and then they start showing off different items like, hey, I like this golf ball because of this reason. I like this golf club because of this reason. Next thing you know, they're, they're being asked to, you know, become a brand ambassador for a specific golf company. Now they're all of a sudden creating their own golf brands. And so you're really seeing very organic. In fact, Torch Warrior Wear, who's just recently on the show, then that, that, you know, she really scaled her business through TikTok. Uh, and, and so you're seeing there are various ways to build your brand. But one of the things, you know, Ian and I mentioned it is just one is consistency, making sure you're really consistent. The storytelling that Ian was mentioning is, is very important as well, but it has to be authentic, right? You know, Ian mentioned, you know, you can go on a Jet GPT and you can refine uh, your story, but it still has to be your story and it has to be authentic to you uh, because that's really what's going to kind of pull the heartstrings. You, you mentioned Nike and I think they're, their uh, slogan is, you know, everybody's an athlete, right? And so even they have the tennis and the basketball and the football and all these other things, but they also have clothes that even if you do not fill the shape of what an athlete, so to speak, should be like, you are still in fact an athlete in their eyes. And so when you put on their product, when you put on their brand, you kind of feel this, this bit of a allure of like, yes, I'm a little bit more fit, slimming them. I can jump higher. I remember that back in the day when I used to get to Jordans, I always thought I can jump higher and stick out my tongue. I still could never dunk it, unfortunately, you know, but, but the sense that that brand created uh, around that is really important. Les Schwab's a local Oregon tire company. You know, they used to have the brand where every single commercial you would see them as soon as you get into their parking lot, they'd have an employee running out to your car to open your door for you. You know, that was their brand. And, and so when you when you started to go to these locations, you kind of expected that kind of level of customer service, right? Uh, I used to ask people, hey, uh, what, what's, a, what's one of the best stores with the best return policies? And almost, almost everybody would say Nordstrom's, right? And Nordstrom's had a phenomenal, like people would say, oh, I take a tire back and they'd take it back, you know, back in the day. Things have changed, certainly, right? But it's, again, the brand that they created uh, around that is, is, is so important. Again, it, with consistency, or with messaging, right? And then building that community, right? Now, Ian, you've had a lot of experience. You've been doing this for some time. 
what advice would you give aspiring entrepreneurs? I would say that it's important to, to see what's out there, see what might work. And I know in a way that's tricky because there's so many different things, but start to explore what might work for you, what you can imagine yourself doing on a daily basis because entrepreneurship takes time. And it's okay that it takes time, but as you start to look around, you're gonna have to dig in somewhere. And you can always pivot later, but I know it's a big trend these days to go from one thing to another thing to another thing. You do three, four things in a year. And the reality is it's gonna take time. If there's elements you don't like about it, fair, but get ready to dig in, to learn, to grow, because success doesn't happen overnight for most people. And that's okay because the strength that it helps you to get to where you're going gives you resilience. So no matter what comes up, you're more prepared. And with that, it's ultimately take action and do your best to be consistent with that action. For me, if I'm trying something new, I like to run it until I know what makes it successful. And that's looking at other people, networking, having conversations, learning, maybe taking courses, looking at videos, trying it myself and reaching a point where I say, okay, I know what this takes to be successful. Is that where I wanna go? Cause there's been a couple of times where I've pivoted and gone, hmm, that's not where I ultimately wanna end up with that. And that's okay. And then I pivot. So take the time, really understand it, figure out how to make it grow because once it does, it's an incredible feeling. But the learning process is, it's worth it, even if it doesn't feel like it in the beginning. It really is. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. And again, share your ideas with other folks that are outside of your inner circle so you can really get a good insight of, do I have a product market fit? And then if you do, okay, well, what's your minimum viable product? Create something and, and, and take it out there and see if individuals are willing to reach in their pocket and actually purchase that item. Uh, and if so, then okay, now, now you have a business. Now you can start focusing on creating a business plan, right? And slowly scale it from there. Uh, like Ian mentioned, you know, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. So, so, so take your time um, building these and just have fun learning. Uh, there's going to be certain aspects of any career that you do not like. Right. There's, there's always something that you do not like. However, uh, take take time and enjoy those learning opportunities because you will eventually scale to the point where you will you will be able to kind of handle off uh, some of these tactics that in operational things that you maybe not want to do and not, might not be your favorite. But having an understanding of what those things are important for your business and how to manage them if you're one of your key players leaves the institution uh, organization for any reason right, is really important because the last thing you want to do is, is have that knowledge shared gone once an employee leaves, because uh, that's very difficult, uh, no matter how much funding you have, uh, it's very difficult to replace knowledge. It really is, and that's, that's a powerful statement. And so understanding what you're doing, but also what's interesting about business these days is there's so many ways to do it. So sometimes it's also thinking, within what you're doing. So to what you said earlier, building that brand and community yourself and getting on social media is an absolute win and I recommend it for everyone. But what if you really aren't that person? You can hire influencers. You can have other people market your product. So if you can't get over a hurdle, who can? How does that approach happen? If you can go out and put in that literal sweat equity and use your body all day, what advantages do you have? If you were like me, you had some health problems, you can't do that. What can you do digitally? So there's so many ways to do things. There's, you know, don't let anything discourage you, but at the same time, as you start to grow, as you start to improve, document, have your system set up, be able to be prepared that if somebody you bring on leaves, you can hire and train the next person. Your entire business doesn't shut down because in the beginning, it's all dependent on you. And as you grow, you want to be able to remove that dependence and still have that success. And, 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 you know, I'm sure, Ian, you know this better than most. It's sometimes very difficult to let go. It's like, you know, you're a parent letting go of your baby. Uh, and so you want to see it succeed, but creating operations that align with the quality of work that you're trying to put forward is imperative in order for it to continue to succeed. Because one day, you know, the way I tell people the first 30 years of my life, I'm building my uh, resume and the last 30 years I'm building my legacy. 
I don't want to be working during my legacy, but I really want to build something that continue to move forward while I'm not here. Now, Ian, before we leave, can you please let the audience know how can they get in contact with you? What's the website? How, if they're interested in learning more about you, uh, how can they find out some more information? Absolutely. So oxygenseller.com is our site. Uh, I'd also like to offer anybody a one hour masterclass on putting out products on Amazon. It won't give you the full detail because there's a lot more information than that, but it will give you the full overview and understanding it. And if you send me an email, Ian, I-A-N, at oxygenseller.com, I will be more than happy to send that out to you. Um, and then social media, you, we're just getting YouTube going. So that's Oxygen Seller. Uh, and then my socials, uh, Ian McIntyre on LinkedIn. But I, I'd say to keep it really simple, just email me, ian at oxygenseller.com. Even if you don't want the, the masterclass and you have any other questions, whatever it is, just let me know and I'll get back to you. I love it. And if that, folks, is too difficult, you can simply visit theshadesofe.com and sign up for the newsletter. We will have Ian's information as well as the offer that he just provided to the listeners on the newsletter the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week after the episode airs. So again, visit theshadesofe.com. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button on the newsletter. And if you feel so kind, please feel free to visit Patreon. Uh, For $5 a month, you can actually help support the podcast, which allows me to bring phenomenal guests like Ian onto the show that could share their knowledge for free. So again, instead of going to a very high price education university like I did in Syracuse, although go orange, I do love you. You can save some money by listening to this podcast. So again, Ian, is there any last words you have for the audience? Yeah, I'd say just keep working at it. If you're ready today, do it. If you're not ready today, you might be ready later on and just be open to it pursue what you can, and you might surprise yourself as to how far you can go. I love it. Ian McIntyre, Oxygen Seller. Folks, again, if you're interested, uh, visit Oxygen Seller or you uh, subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. This episode, as well as the uh, transcription, will be on the website. And you can view this episode on YouTube or you can follow us on social, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We also do post some TikToks here and there. Although, I, to, you know, going back on that consistency, I kind of need to do a better job about the TikTok. But as you said, Ian, you know, we're the, we wear a lot of different hats as entrepreneurs. So sometimes you you, you got to figure out which one's going to drive the most of value back to your back to your website. And, and so far, TikTok hasn't been the one for me, but that's OK. We'll continue to work on it. All right, folks, thank you again for listening and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or visit theshadesofe.com.